Uh, so as Cameron said, my name is Sandy Lacey. I am a just turned 40 year old woman. Um, I have brown hair. I'm wearing green glasses, a brown blazer, jeans. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about what we're building at Perkins with regards to creating uh, innovation and coalescing and convening folks around this concept of disability tech. Um, I want to uh, thank my hosts, and I also just wanna ask my colleagues who are here in the room if you could just raise your hands. I'm not here alone, I have four colleagues here. So afterwards, if you wanna talk to someone uh, from Perkins, feel free to go find one of them as well. All right, so before we dive into the How Innovation Center, I want to talk really quickly about um, our namesake, uh, Samuel Gridley Howe. So on the slide is a, f is a painting from the 1800s of a white man with what looks like green eyes and brown hair, and he has a white popped collar. Um, and this is Samuel Gridley Howe. He was the founding director of Perkins, and he was really a true visionary for his time. Howe believed that people with disabilities should be fully integrated into mainstream society. And for the 1830s, this was a radical idea. Uh, he was a social entrepreneur. So he found the first students for the school. He found the first teachers for the school. And as we say in the startup world, he really took the school from zero to one. Uh, he also was an innovator in both teaching methodologies and in technology. So Howe um, actually educated a woman named Laura Bridgman, who we believe was the first deaf-blind woman to receive a formal education. And he, in his spare time, uh, developed uh, Boston Line Type, which was a uh, novel tactile language and a precursor to Braille. So we thought it was only fitting that we uh, named our Innovation Center after Howe. Because it is William, uh, Women's History Month, I would be remiss if I didn't mention his wife, uh, Julia Ward Howe, as well. She was a force in her own right. Uh, she was an abolitionist and ran an anti-slavery newspaper. And she is the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. So there you go. Um, let's advance and talk a little bit about what the Howe Innovation Center is. So uh, really what we want to do at Perkins through this initiative is connect the community of people with disabilities with innovators around the world. And when I say community of people with disabilities, I mean all disabilities, uh, not just visual impairment. 50% uh, of our students at Perkins with a visual impairment have a second disability. And we've been working around the world for 200 years with uh, people with multiple disabilities. And so we really wouldn't be serving our community if we focused solely on visual impairments. So this is really um, an initiative across all disability communities. And we've started with research. Now I'm gonna put a pin in it because we're gonna talk so much about this, our, our starting point, and I'm just gonna move on to the other three areas of focus at how. Um, the first is we really wanna amplify the lived experience. So there are really sticky and persistent problems in daily living, education, and employment that the disability community deeply understands those problem points, but maybe innovators aren't aware of them. And so if we can use Perkins to help amplify and crowdsource those problem statements and make them easily accessible to the innovative community out there, we might be able to channel well-intentioned entrepreneurial activity to the top problem statements that the community wants to see people working on. Um, we really want to help entrepreneurs as well. So common problems that entrepreneurs face, finding capital uh, to get invested into their companies, finding customers for primary market research and user testing, uh, getting your product deployed out into the real world for feedback and, um, and, and, and how it works when it's out in the wild. 
These are things that we believe we can build programming around so that we can help entrepreneurs get co-designed products to market. And then finally, we're going to do that by also building a community uh, beyond uh, the community of people with disabilities and entrepreneurs. We want to bring investors, whether it's angel investors, grant writers, VCs, we want to bring them to the table. We want to bring um, academic institutions to the table. These are students of engineering, design, business. Make them aware of what disability technology is and help them get plugged into opportunities. Um, we've also believed that universities have cutting edge uh, technologies that could be applied to accelerate accessibility and we can help plug them in. I want to give a shout out right now uh, to Olin College of Engineering. We've already entered into a partnership with them. Some of their students are helping us uh, visualize the data from our database so that it will be accessible. So we're already kind of uh, marching down this path. And then finally, big tech companies, uh, large corporates that care about DEIA, that care about um, accessibility and inclusion, we want to partner with them as well. So now that we've talked about who we're named after and what we're doing, I want to talk about the research that we've developed and uh, where this can possibly take us. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, <clears throat> when I came to Perkins uh, about a year ago, I, I'm a former analyst. And so I started trying to figure out who's active within the space. And I found really amazing um, incubator and accelerator programs focused on disability tech globally, uh, like ATF, ATS Labs, um, Remarkable, just, just to name a few. And I found that the research, though, was really tough for me to get, to get a handle on. Um, there were like market maps and market research for walkers, wheelchairs, canes, and like mobility aids, or digital accessibility and the market there. But I couldn't find any sort of market map around startups that were leveraging cutting edge technologies to make the world accessible. So I thought, Let, let's build it. So I made a really ugly database in Excel, and I'm proud to say that now it has over 750 companies in it. Um, you know, just to briefly say the difference between disability tech and assistive technology is that I believe assistive tech is a, com is a major component of disability tech, but it's not all of it. So the example I like to give is an inclusive employment startup um, is definitely going to increase accessibility for people with disabilities if it is successful, but it's not an assistive technology um, helping somebody increase their, their function. Um, so it's actually a broader market. And I want to add that we're really building this in public. So I'm taking that startup concept, concept of build in public, and if you have thoughts and ideas as to the language or the taxonomy that we're using, I want to um, hear from you and partner with you and you know, build this together. Uh, so we, once we had the 750 companies, I started cataloging them according to the community of people with disabilities the company is trying to serve. So is this building for people with visual impairments, people with uh, mobility disabilities, um, across eight different disabilities? And then 18 disability innovation themes. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. So GDI Hub is a phenomenal group in the UK. And they had already developed a taxonomy around how you could innovate in the space of disability. So when something's perfect, um, adopt it, right? And so um, they have you know, self-care travel, navigation, communication, inclusive employment. These are the types of categories that, in, that um, disability innovation themes would touch. And then in partnership with a wonderful uh, Perkins volunteer, we have a very robust volunteer program and we're always looking for volunteers, um, I developed a technology taxonomy. And this is where it gets kind of 
really heady, I would say, um, but a lot themes, categories, and subcategories. So for the first time, we can actually query this database and say, show me all companies innovating for the visually impaired in the space of navigation using computer vision and haptics. And it will spit out the companies that fit those criteria. Um, we've also started to add the investors, who they are and how much money they've put into the space. Uh, the geography, where are the companies located? And uh, the product status, you know, is this company uh, shipping a product? Is it still in R&D? Did they close? Because uh, some of these companies have already started and, and folded. And we've been, been able to see some really cool trends now. Um, I want to shout out to Dylan, who really put the meat on the database. He's in the audience right now, and that was, it's a tough job, but two people had to do it, and it was me and him. Um, so this is the first insight into um, what we're gleaning from the sector. So this is a perceptual market map on the screen. It's a common way that the tech industry looks at activity within a space. And on the slide, there are a bunch of company logos, and they are clustered according to uh, the type of uh, technology that they are. So these companies are all innovating for just the blind and the visually impaired. So this is not all disabilities right here. This is just for visual impairment. And this is only in the space of navigation. There are 106 companies trying to crack the nut right now on navigation for the blind and the visually impaired. And in uh, size order, the largest grouping is wearables. Think of you know, an Apple Watch, a Fitbit. Uh, those are examples of wearables that the general population uses. In this space, the most common are uh, headsets or glasses. And then following from that, we have other, which would be a uh, wrist wearable, a clip, a ring, a uh, harness. Uh, the next active uh, section or with the most activity is a wayfinding app, so orientation and mobility within a space. Um, and then identification apps, this is really like, tell me what this is that's in front of me. Is this a can of tomato sauce or is this a can of soup, for example? Um, and then uh, smart canes, so trying to bring the white cane, bring uh, technology to the white cane. The second half of the perceptual market map because it doesn't fit um, is uh, the most active space here are tactile displays and inclusive employment. We also have education, travel, mobile phones, keyboards, and digital therapy. And if you like this, I want uh, everybody to know that at the end of my presentation, there's a QR code where you can scan and you can join our community and this will be downloaded in an accessible version onto your laptop. So, um, and this is just the beginning. So this is a perceptual market map. Um, we can also start seeing some trends in geography. So at least 140 companies are based in the US. That's around 40% of the, the global market is based in the US, uh, innovating for the visually impaired. The top five countries are the US with 141, the United Kingdom with 26, Israel with 18, India with 17, and Australia with 16. Now keep in mind, these are again, just companies innovating for the blind and the visually impaired. So not, not all disabilities. And 48 countries are home to at least one startup in the space. Uh, from here, the next slide, we have a vertical bar graph. And this is the top 10 companies um, that have uh, raised over $350 million in the space of visual impairment with OrCam, which is an Israel-based uh, wearable that attaches to a pair of glasses, they've raised the most with 86.4 million. And then I want to spend a, lot, a chunk of time on this slide and the following. Um, so we see most of the activity is in the space of navigation, and that's important. Now, some might think that navigation is only getting from point A to point B. But if you can really get navigation right, you'll start influencing some very thorny problems that persist within the visually impaired community. Our um, employment rate is 40%, which means 60% of people in the US who are blind or visually impaired are not employed. 
our college completion rate, um, six out of 10 students with visual impairments who start college do not get a degree. So if you don't feel safe, confident, or comfortable getting from one place to another, it hinders your ability to participate in education and employment. Uh, so I'm really happy to see a lot of activity within this space because it has ripple effects in some of the key problem areas that our, our community faces. Um, following navigation, we see a lot of activity in like custom tablets and mobile devices, as well as tactile design. Um, and also education and inclusive employment. We can break it down even further now, and this is why I'm kind of obsessed with this database. So the navigation, we can see how companies are trying to tack the pro tackle the problem of navigation. Uh, wearables are the most common method. There are over 35 companies acti actively trying to develop a wearable device to uh, enable navigation. And um, glasses are the most common category with at least 23 startups globally operating within this space. Collectively, these companies have raised $135 million. And um, 13 of them are shipping a product, which to me was very interesting because this is a, a hardware investment. Is A hardware company is hard to stand up so the fact that 13 of the glasses companies have a product that they're currently selling in the market is a pretty high, uh, high rate of getting, of getting something out the door. But glasses aren't the only type of wearable. As we mentioned before, harnesses, rings, uh, wrist wearables. Uh, they've raised a total of around $14.3 million in financing. And there are at least 15 companies taking this approach, with uh, wrist wearable being the most common. But we found two harnesses, a clip, and a ring also. And wayfinding apps. Uh, we have at least 33 startups that, are, that have an app in the wayfinding space. And they're all taking a variety of, of different approaches. Good Maps, which spun out of the American Printing House for the Blind, they closed a $3.5 million seed round last year from a Kentucky-based venture fund. Uh, right here is an Israel-based Israel, Israeli um, startup that is using uh, partnerships and sensor technology to increase accessibility in indoor navigation. And they're being deployed in every McDonald's um, in Israel right now, and they just opened up a US office. So there's a lot of activity here, and I, I could go on and on, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move us along. And here's where the technology taxonomy comes in. So now we can also see that uh, navigation companies are using a wide variety of technologies with geofencing and image recognition being the most popular technologies implemented. Some of the companies are, are using a combination of three or four technologies, uh, so it's not one for each company. But it's very interesting to see how a lot of these companies are harnessing, you know, attaching onto one technology and really trying to leverage it in the navigation space. So I know that was a lot, but it's just the beginning. And um, this is just the, the first research uh, insight that we've shared. In fact, this is the first public event for the Howe Innovation Center. So I'm really excited about it. Thank you. Um, and I really just want to say that you know, all ships rise with the tide. A lot of folks have been active within the disability tech ecosystem for a while. And I think that entrepreneurs, accessibility professionals, people with the lived experience of having a disability, any combination thereof, uh, we want to hear from you. There are so many ways we can work together here. This QR code will take you to a sign up page where you will get our research for free. Um, and you'll hear about programming that we roll out, future speaking engagements that we have, and it will also be a great way to connect with us and help inform us in the direction that uh, things that you'd like to see uh, be created for the community. If this doesn't work for you, also innovation at perkins.org is a great way to 
uh, reach me directly. So I just wanted to thank everyone so much for participating in this tonight. And we've had data, right? Like I've given you this like high level overview of data, but now you get to hear the fun stories behind the data. So I've actually invited uh, two folks who have been really helpful to me so far this year as I've been standing up this initiative. Uh, we have Keith Kirkland, who's the chief haptics officer of WearWorks. He's gonna talk about True Tales as a disability tech entrepreneur. Um, and we have Ron Russo from Five Line Ventures. He's invested in the space and he's gonna tell us what it's been like as an investor within the space. So I'm gonna cede the microphone to Keith and he's gonna come on up and, and share the WearWorks story. Thank you all so much. Hello everyone. You're welcome. That was amazing. So much data. I'm like, wow. I wish this data was available when we started the company. We could have made so many different choices. <laughs> so I appreciate that and all of the hard work that I'm sure went into scouring the earth um, to find all of us technology companies that are focused on trying to make an impact in the disability space. So my name is Keith Kirkland. I am the co-founder and chief haptic officer of WearWorks. Haptic means touch, in case you don't know, nothing personal. And what we do is we build products and experiences that use the skin as a communications channel to deliver information in a more intuitive and less obtrusive way. Now, we started with the idea of navigation. I mean, well, actually, I started with this idea of trying to build a suit that would allow a person to download Kung Fu and the suit would teach you vibrations. <laughs> but we had a sense that Navigation had a bigger market. Um, and as we dug into the space, really, what we were finding was, is, and you know, like a lot of people ask me, it's like, oh my God, what made you want to work with people who are blind? Like, do you have a blind family member? I'm like, no, I never met a person who was blind until I started a company to help people who were blind. Right? And, and, and you go, well, how do you do that? And why do you do that? Right? And, and, and our story is, is very different. Is we were selling a vision of navigation and we felt like this was the opening opportunity. But more, we saw navigation as the pinnacle because somehow someone deemed vision as the most important sense and then you know, um, everything else was like less than that. And so when you look at the research dollars spent over the last 100 years on the five senses, you'll see dramatically that most of it is in vision. That's why my Oculus Quest costs $249, but a Braille keyboard costs, correct me if I'm wrong, 2,500? Why? Because we cared more to make VR headsets cheaper. And we put the research dollars behind it. And that's what I mean by care, right? Is we put research dollars behind it. Bo spent $50 million developing noise canceling in 15 years. His CEO came to him and said, hey, Bose, Dr. Bose, sorry. Rest in peace, Dr. Bose. You know, Dr. Bose, uh, we spent $50 million in 15 years developing noise canceling. He was like, wow, $50 million. He's like, if I was the CEO of a publicly traded company, I would have been fired years ago, right? And, and the thing is, is that like right now, we are in a space where um, we're looking at how do we take longer term visions around what it means to build products and to build ecosystems around them. So now vision is the king. We're gonna walk in and upsurp the king by showing that you can do navigation with only touch. And that was our original mission, was how do we get people out of their phones and back into the real world and we started by going to who, obviously, travelers. Right? Who needs to get out of their phone more than people who are traveling? Right? I lived in Japan for six months. Addresses don't make sense. Right? You know, like I had to. The cops couldn't help me figure out where I was at. They pulled out a book and everything. Right? But if I could just vibrate around and didn't have to trust in that piece of it, then I could use my vision and my hearing to pay attention to what's going on around me. And of course, if you're vision or hearing isn't accessible to you, well, then that's a pretty big challenge. So we took on this big opportunity, navigation. One billion people use Google Maps every single month. And as we grew in, we really looked at it and we saw the opportunity was really, how do we take this information and communicate it through touch? And this is where my previous history of working with a Kung Fu suit Essentially, I was trying to find a way to leverage um, communicating information directly through the skin without needing someone physically there to tell you or, or to verbally tell you. And so 
I remember my Kung Fu practice and I remember that, you know, my teacher would move my joints into position with touch, not say a single word. So it's like, how do we leverage that technology and navigation? And ultimately what we did is we built what we call the haptic corridor. The haptic corridor is a 360 degree touch based experience that when you're going in the right direction, you feel absolutely nothing. You spin slightly to the left, about 20 degrees, left of center or right of center, you'll get a tiny vibration. And the vibration scales the wronger you are. Until you're 180 degrees the wrong way, we give you the loudest vibration we can. What this does is it plays a simple game of hot and cold through touch that allows you to know exactly which way is the right way to go and tells you with volume how wrong you are. And we found that like people who are blind and visually impaired really gravitated toward the technology. Now, I talked about the idea of starting with travelers. There was one problem. I used to spend 30 minutes telling a sighted person why a visual map is a problem. 30 minutes. I'd have two minutes left to talk about how haptics is going to change the world. Wasn't a lot of time. It wasn't a great pitch, right? And then ultimately at the end, we knew this was great for the blind community, but we knew that we, we felt like this will, will get there at the end after we make sure it works for everyone else first because we had no idea we could even navigate people using haptics. So like, let's start there. Right? And at the end of the day, what happened is, is that we realized, and this was, you know, South by Southwest is coming up. I'm heading there on Friday. Um, you know, they become investors of ours. I'm actually going to do a performance. Um, I'm doing a haptic rap to ha educate people about touch. Maybe I'll let you hear a verse of it. But, um, you know, we, when our first trip to South by Southwest, my team went down there and we met someone. We just pulled random people out of the crowd and get them to try our band on. And, you know, like they would spin around. And then we would get a lot of people to stop in the right direction. We were just using this to get data because, you know, this is how you got data when you don't have any money. Um, and it was great. It was great. And one of the people that we pulled into the audience happens to be, he was like, wow, this is amazing. I work for the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. You stick to the, to the blind school right now. And we're like, right now, right now? And so we like, okay, we're about to leave tomorrow. So me and my co-founder, we literally pack up at that moment. <laughs> jump in a taxi and go to like the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Long story short, we, no one was expecting us. We saw some people in the parking lot. It's like, hey, let's ask them, you know, and someone, someone's like, hey, we have some technology that we think will help people who are blind, we're not sure. They was like, well, uh, um, how, what is it? Someone was like, well, go here and do this. And someone was like, well, how does it work? And then when he tried it on, and now I have this joke that says, when we make people spin around, they become our friends. Because like, <laughs> put the band on him, he spun around, and by the end, he was like, you need to speak to Scott Bowman, he's the assistant commissioner, his office is on the second floor. <laughs> we walked into Scott Bowman's office, very unannounced, with a crew of about four employees guiding us, plus with a crew of our own three. It was kind of like, I imagine like, it looked like the mafia was showing up for you, or a hitman. Anyways, I was like, diffused, like, hey, Scott, you know, we're friendly. Um, and we have the technology, we'd love to spend some time with you. And you know, like truth be told, like he gave us like four hours of his day, let us use his office. We brought some of his employees off, who were blind off of their work schedules so they can talk to us and try their device out. And by the end of that conversation, all three of my co-founders, and we never agree, but all three of my co-founders, we walked out unanimous in the, for independent reasons that like the only way to do what we were doing is to start with the blind and visually impaired market first. And that transformed our entire company. This was 2016. The minute that happens, we start going in, investors start understanding what it is that we're doing now. And more importantly, sighted people start to see the opportunity for themselves. So now I give a presentation and always someone sighted comes over to me and says, hi, I'm not blind, but I have a hard time figuring out which way I'm facing when I get out the train. Can I use your technology? And we're like, yes. And, and that was the point, you know, like when we initially started, we went to the National Federation of the Blind and they told us, don't build a blind device. Build a device that everybody can use that's optimized for the blind experience. It's like, if you build it only for us, we won't want it. But if you build it and it works great for us and for everyone else, like we'll find you, don't worry. And that was the message that we took from the whole experience. And so now, where are we? Um, the Wayband app is available in the App Store. We have a navigation app, so we kind of fall into two bubbles. We have the wearable and the navigation app. So our navigation app is available. And initially, we started with this idea of only using it for the Wayband. 
ultimately what we realized was was that with the economic disparities, unemployment statistics that we just heard about, that, that was a big challenge to make people buy another device. So first thing we did was like, hey, can we make the phone vibrate so that they don't need to buy anything additional, right? And then we added, of course, the Apple Watch integration into other smart devices. Like, can we tag into what it is that you're already wearing? Now our patents cover a haptic corridor. It doesn't cover just the Wayband. We can put the haptic corridor on your phone and your Apple Watch. We can put it in the seat of your car. We're still covered. Right? And so this opened up a whole opportunity for us. But more importantly, it opened up a different business model. Um, so after we deliver, delivered the hardware products to market, we realized that we had an even bigger opportunity. Companies like Uber and like Disney and like you know, Waymo and you know, mapping companies were like, hey, I don't really want to use your app or your band, but if I could take your haptic corridor and put it in my thing, well, that would be amazing because then I would have accessible navigation very easily. And then we started to look like, wow, well, if we could just integrate our haptic corridor into a Google Maps, a billion people have accessible navigation instantly. Changes the entire dynamics of what we can do versus the Wayband. Now, we still make the Wayband. You can still go to Amazon and buy it right now. It's available, <laughs> right? But one of the things that we also did is that because of this new business model, right, I listen to audiobooks exclusively, right? How much technology goes, how much of that money goes back to the blind community because that's who created it, right? That's what it's created for, right? Siri, exclusively I use Siri. I use voice assistance for everything. I don't touch my phone unless I have to, right? Again, how much of that money, now the technology being available is great, right? More audiobooks means more people have accessibility, but from an equity point of view, could we do something a little bit different? And this is where we were like, well, what if we got enterprise customers to make the app available for free? So the Wayband app was $99. The Wayband cost $249. As of last month, the Wayband app is now available for free with an optional $0.99 cents a year just to support the development. And now every person who's blind, open all around the world, can download Wayband for free. And we were able to do this because, again, we were thinking about business models that leverage technology that was built for the blind community into a software enterprise solutions and having that pay for the technology so the community can have access to it. And we see this as like not only just a great opportunity for us, but like a new way of doing things, right? You know, like because at that point, like we talk about this idea of feedback and like being important. I'm not blind, right? We built a, we built a company for people who are blind and visually impaired. How do we do it? Because we listen. We put out crap, they told us it was crap, and we fixed it. That's it, it's a very simple process. Just listen, right? And, and, like, and because we listened, we, we got access to, to so many people who were just really willing to, like we had people like testing in Alaska, like there are way bands in Saudi Arabia right now, it's crazy, it blows my mind. Um, but we've been on this journey for seven long years, right? And it took a long time for people to get to a point where we are now, where like obviously we need technology that is accessible, right? You know, like this was a niche market when I was talking to investors like six years ago, right? And so I just wanna say that all in all, our journey has been pretty amazing. Um, really wanna thank, you know, like a lot of our supporters, Sandy, thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to be here. And as a, as a, as a side note, as my ending, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share the first verse of my haptic rap with you, right? So, thank you, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, side story, I've been rapping kind of since I was 16 years old, not really. I wanted to be a rapper, realized I wouldn't be any good because Jay-Z was too great. And so I decided to do something else with my life. Blind people run marathons now, yay. Oh, we did that. I forgot to say that. We helped the first person who was blind run the New York City Marathon without sighted assistance. Um, and so, you know, like, like, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, and so, you know, like, I, I made a good choice, right? But now I've been like, how do I jump back into my personal expression? And ultimately, I realized that we have a marketing problem with haptics because no one knows what the word means. So I made a rap to tell you. Right, now, let's see. Let's see how this goes. All right. We have a vision, we have a vision, we have a vision, we have a vision, we have a vision of a world that doesn't need vision. We have a vision of a world that doesn't need vision. Okay, wait, sorry, I messed that up. I'm gonna start that again. 
this is good practice for me. I'm like, I have to get on stage. So this is like, in my car, it sounds totally different when I do it. I'm way better. All right, okay. <laughs> um, we have a vision of a world that doesn't need vision. Elevate and touch to the level of sight and sound, and that's our mission. Research spending. Today is access tomorrow for all of our children. Look at the spending. Over the last hundred years, spread over each of the five of our senses, seeing is believing. Most went the vision, second went the sound, which is pretty far distant. For a hundred years, money only spent on two senses. Isn't that senseless? That shit is senseless. Here's my two cents, and vision is king and touches in prison. Patriarch of all the senses is sight. Who really made that decision? Who the F made that decision? No one with limited vision, none of the 285 million, and wasn't listening to the 460 million folks with limited hearing. Digital, so sight and sound driven that it left like a billion on the wrong side of a digital divide with virtually no pot to piss in. The future is touched, that's our mission. Where works is haptics, touched with the weight and intention of dramatically making a difference. You need to listen. Thank you. And now I am going to introduce Mr. Ron Russo. Well, that, that is going to be difficult to follow. Uh, I will not be ending with a rap uh, of any sort. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the sponsors, Sandy Perkins, for having me as well tonight to tell you a little bit about the story of ARCS and the formation of the company and how we got involved in it. And maybe a little bit about um, how we see the opportunity uh, to address problems that have existed you know, forever uh, for folks with visual impairments uh, or blindness. So we're, we're investors, Five Line Ventures, early stage investor. Uh, we invested in a company that was founded by two Italian entrepreneurs, uh, technologists in their own right. And when we met them, uh, they were working out of a small studio in Chiasso, Switzerland, and they very intentionally built their workforce to include two employees with visual impairment. And I think their vision for what Horus, which is the original company was, was to have real dialogue in a community and understand what the true needs uh, of that community were, as opposed to uh, what we've seen, I think, for decades from technology solutions, which are developed by technologists uh, who really don't have a good understanding of what the, the true needs are. And, and I think that, that there's a couple layers to that. I think that f for me, there's the foundational needs of uh, assistive technology, using that, that term broadly. And I think that there are the blocking and tackling needs of, of form and function, the technology that addresses specific elements of that need, which uh, Sandy laid out. Some of them are navigation, object detection, text reading, facial recognition, and so on. But even today, in, in 2023, much of the technology that exists still feels very clinical. It feels very sterile. It feels antiseptic, uh, and it's not been built uh, as consumer products are built. It hasn't been built with magnetism or sexiness or fun. And, you know, the iterations that ARCS has gone through, you know, the first investment ARCS was made in 2016. So we're working on a similar timeline to Keith and, and, and we've iterated quite a bit over those seven years. And uh, I think there's been some some great victories and some some terrible defeats. But I think the best part for us uh, has been the learnings that we've gathered from the dialogue, true dialogue, and, and by listening first. Um, you know, I think one of the most frustrating elements uh, for me of, of understanding what exists currently and even the strategic vision of some of the largest incumbent technology companies is that they still to this day don't engage with a community. They don't listen to the true needs of a community. And as a result, some of the companies without getting into them specifically, which have raised the most capital on those slides, 
have virtually no product market fit with the community that they originally intended to uh, pro provide product to. And to me, that's in certain ways an indictment of philosophy. It is an indictment of uh, vision of founders. And I think we uh, and the founders of, of Horace and then Charles Leclerc, who's the current CEO of ARCS, have come at it quite differently. Um, we met Charles actually through one of our colleagues who showed up here unannounced, uh, who's the CEO and founder of one of our other portfolio companies, so it was a nice surprise for me. But Jan uh, helped us find Charles, and Charles uh, didn't have experience in assistive technology. He was worked in gaming and in computer vision and in augmented uh, audio, um, um, augmented AR, uh, audio AR rather. And as a result, his views on what arcs should be, I think dovetailed nicely with our views that the foundational needs are still the same and you, you must have text reading or object recognition or navigation, whatever you purport to make available to this community must be there and it must work flawlessly. That is difficult. But beyond that, these offerings should be fun. They should be exciting. And he's integrated, I think, some of those elements into what ARCS is. And he has some scene recognition, which is beautiful. Is it foundationally necessary for object recognition or facial recognition or text? No but it can give you the audio experience of looking at a sunrise or of a rainstorm or of a, you know, a cityscape with buildings. And I credit Charles with understanding, you know, some of the other elements of what we believed arcs would be. You know, when I, when I think about the opportunity to affect change amongst, you know, hundreds of millions of people with visual impairment, I'm as excited as I've ever been about arcs. And I think the opportunity in certain ways is more urgent and technology continues to evolve in a, in a positive way. And there are other wearables and pieces of hardware and software and AI and machine learning, computer vision and cameras, et cetera, continue to evolve and I think progress beautifully. And, and there's no reason to recreate the wheel. You know, Sandy and Keith both said it. Things that work, we should adopt. We're, we're never going to be able to compete with Google or Microsoft or incumbent technology companies that are building some of the underlying technology that we may leverage. But the reality is that without the effort and without the dialogue, it will be very difficult to make products that truly can change the lives of people who use that product. So just getting back to the origin story a little bit, um, when, we early, when we first got um, attached to ARCs, which was Horace at the time. We, we really believed in the founders. We believed in their mission and in their vision and in the development. And, you know, it's been an, an interesting ride. Uh, I think like Keith, we had uh, some thoughts about uh, scaling and, you know, it's a hardware device at, at the end of the day, although there's elements of software that we use, which we believe uh, could provide a platform experience to, uh, to, to larger entities that might want to integrate it. But ultimately, we fall back on the user experience. And the user experience uh, for ARCs is something that uh, is, is pretty amazing. And I feel you know, some pride, not in the authorship, but the pride and the effort that's been expended you know, over the course of six years to push through and to try to understand those needs. You know, it's one of our um, investors in another business gave me an analog, which I love, which is, I think, very relevant to this. It's, it, was, it was really relating to healthcare more specifically. But the concept that he introduced was that healthcare, healthcare organizations today create a menu. They deliver a menu to a patient and say, here, John Smith, take a look at this menu and you pick one of the 10 things that are on that menu. The reality is that those 10 choices may not be at all relevant to John Smith because they don't have a dialogue. There is no iterative nature of that relationship. There is no listening that happens. And for us, the same holds true. You know, I think we are better for the failures that we've had. We are better for the understandings that we've gained over the last six plus years and the iterations that uh, have been a, a product of failure. And there's been tons of them, you know, over that time. 
it's been really, really interesting for me and Sandy. I give you and Perkins, you know, tremendous amount of credit. It's pretty incredible what exists, you know, over the last 200 years and, and looking forward, I think the future is quite bright. And one of the terms, which, you know, these are Sandy's words, not mine, but progress over perfection is everything. And I think we've tried to live those words at ARCS. We know that ARCS is not perfect. There are certainly problems with it. And, you know, it, it is a wearable device that sits on the side of your head. It's a stereoscopic camera with bone conducting audio. And that was intentionally created by the founders because if you have a visual impairment, the last thing in the world you want to do is lose one of your other senses. So bone conducting audio gives you the sound that you need without broadcasting it to the rest of the world around you. And that in certain ways is very keep it simple, stupid and very obvious. But in other ways, I think it reflects the mechanisms that we've tried to employ and to understand and to listen, truly listen. But I think, you know, as I look at some of those charts, it's incredible. It really is, is incredible. And, and a lot of that progress has happened over the course of the last five or six years. And that's the good news. The good news is that there's never been more focus on trying to truly address the needs of folks with visual impairment. And I think the, the good news is that there's never been more will amongst the leaders, the incumbent technology companies, to try to help support that. So we have worked quite closely with a number of those companies in understanding what technology they have, which maybe we could layer in, maybe we can add, we can partner. And even some of the earlier stage companies, I would consider us earlier stage uh, as well. But even the earlier stage companies, I think, have a much more open mind about collaboration and you know co-support or co-development of product. And um, I guess for me, it, it, it comes back to that. You know, you have to have that commitment, and you have to believe, and you have to be able to to forge forward. And you know, I think I've seen what ARCs can provide. I've seen the feedback from users and the feedback has been really truly excellent and I, I give Charles the credit for that. But it's really, really fun to see someone who uses ARCs for the first time uh, and has a great experience. And you, know, you understand that if there's 300, 4, 500 million people in the world whose lives you could affect, either through independence or autonomy or excitement, or magnetism, or fun. There's no reason why that shouldn't happen. And I, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about what the future looks like for us, for some of the other companies that, that we're following, fast following, or, or collaborating with. And so I, I, would, I would extend the same offer that I think that Sandy extended. I would love to hear from all of you. you know, we, we do try to reach out to our community, and we do want to understand what things you may want or need. I think we also try to create, you know, a bona fide feedback loop. You know, and one of the examples I gave was, um, you know, we've we've been working on a a, um, a way to, in effect, create a blockchain, not a blockchain in the sense of currency, but create a transparent feedback loop for our community. So that transparent feedback loop would enable me as a user to say, on March seventh at eight thirty. Text reading didn't work well. I was trying to read a menu or a book or a letter. That feedback then lives in the public domain. And we then, as an organization, must respond to that query. And maybe we respond to it tonight, maybe we respond to it tomorrow, maybe we understand that there's an issue. We may not be able to solve that issue Im immediately, but being responsive is a start. You know, some of these technologies that exist currently, and again, I'll go back to the largest technology companies that exist, don't have a feedback loop. And they're not held accountable for the shortcomings or the gaps that exist in the products that they brought to market. And there's no way for a user to understand whether or not those companies know there was a problem or working on a solution or even care to do either of those two things. So I think for us, we're trying to establish that dialogue transparently and openly and presently and in a way that um, I think builds um, a rapport and builds a, a bona fide level of trust in the community that we're out here trying to solve some real problems and also trying to have some fun 
along the way. So I don't know how we are on time. I didn't put up a, a timer on this, but I thank all of you for being here today. And I thank you, Sandy, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak. I look forward to speaking with some of you uh, afterwards or in the future, but thanks again. Uh, and uh, that's all I have. Yeah, great job. All right, uh, thank you so much, everyone. That concludes the speaking part of our program, does it? Or, no, we have, yes, okay, great. We're gonna get a close out here. Here we go. Well, if we have time, do we have time for Q&A, Ken? Yeah, oh, great. And, okay, and uh, we have a mic here for uh, Q&A oh, as well. Okay. All right, uh, before I give it to uh, audience and webcast uh, questions, does anyone in the audience here have a question? They'd like to ask. All right. Uh, hi. I uh, just have a question regarding the mapping. Do you think you'll add um, potential investors to a potential map so people can quickly access accelerators and investors that may be more amenable to a longer time frame that takes the disability tech product yes. out into the world? Yes, great question. Um, so it's on our near-term roadmap to create an open-sourced like Airtable, basically, of uh, angel investors interested in disability tech or assistive technology and venture funds as well. So this is also a call. Um, feel free to send them our way if you know them. Uh, we have a bunch, but if you're one who's listening to, please do reach out. Uh, we want to make that list available. Um, we'll also probably put together a map of all the um, incubators and accelerators that focus on disability technology. Uh, so there's a variety of things that we can do there. Um, I'm curious about the active development of your database that you're working on and how you're going about maintaining uh, the, the accuracy of it currently and, and discovering new players in the market as, as the industry evolves. Yeah, great question. Uh, so we've got a lot of alerts set. Uh, so every day we have inbound. Um, the more people we tell what we're doing, the more people, the more companies people send us, right? Um, we also have an advisory group. Uh, Kurt Keith is one of our advisory group members, um, and Charles from um, ARX is, is one of our advisory group members as well. They're consistently scouring to see kind of what's going on out there. But really the answer is, I looked at like all the disability tech accelerators and incubator programs. I read every market research report I could. I scoured CB Insights, Crunchbase, DealBook uh, to call the the core companies and then we just add as we go. Um, but Dylan is our full-time uh, data uh, analyst co-op. So we actually have like a, a full-time resource dedicated to the research side of things. Yeah. Okay, a question from the webcast. Um, what do the speakers think about the sonification of charts? How useful it could be for the visually impaired comparing with the conventional text alternatives? So it's a it's a great question. Um, actually, within our partnership with Olin College of Engineering, we've been working with uh, Perkins Access, which is our uh, digital accessibility consulting group as well, uh, to test the sonification of charts and data. So we did a variety of user testing sessions with folks with different visual impairments, so low vision, uh, blind, uh, uh, blind later in life, uh, you know, so a variety of different tests to see how uh, folks with visual impairments liked to absorb charts and graphs. And we did some sonification testing in there as well. Um, over the next month or two, we're gonna be putting those computer visualizations with some sonification up on our site. So they're not ready yet, but soon-ish, they'll be up there. <laughs> How do you uh, consider companies that do not focus on disability tech, but may have a department that focuses on disability tech? Were there any edge cases that you had to have a debate about whether to include or not include? Yes. Um, so actually, there's like a variety of companies that are not in our database that are actually doing a lot with regards to disability tech, meaning like Microsoft. Like I didn't, I didn't put a big company in here. I really tried to do like a startup market analysis. Um, 
<clears throat> so there are that that's a whole other research realm, right? Like what what is big what are big tech companies doing with regards to disability and accessibility, which is on our our research roadmap. Um, there were some companies where I would find something and it actually was just like a research project at a university that stopped. And so I had to make the decision, like, do I put that in? Did these students actually try to form a company and get something going? And there were probably around 30 to 50 of those where I found like newspaper articles on them, but I chose not to include those projects because they didn't actually advance to the stage of people pursuing them as a company. Thank you very much. Another one from the webcast, we've got Sandy, what is the Howe Center's business model? Is it a combination of VC and private equity, public funding, or grants? Yeah. Uh, so, great question. Uh, we are putting together our business model right now. And if you would like to invest in the Howe Innovation Center, please find me or Natalie or Allie afterwards. <laughs> awesome. Another one from the webcast, and please raise your hand in the audience if you have questions. Um, for Keith, are there any haptic standards? For example, two buzzes for turn left. Um, so from a point of view of haptic standards for the world, not really, right? And, and the haptic industry is kind of coming together to work these things out. And that's a big part of what we see. Like I've been talking to a lot of CEOs of other haptics companies. I can say that there are other CEOs of other haptics companies now, which is amazing. But like a lot of what's going on is like, how do we make sure that we get device interoperability for haptics and feeling from one device to another? But for our device, if we're talking about um, standards for like navigating, we've built in like a, a system of buzzes that allow you. So we don't do the buzz buzz thing because remembering too many signals becomes a challenge. Um, and I think that the limit is about five to eight signals that you can remember before you actually have to start studying. Um, and we don't want to make uh, you know, language acquisition is, is really hard. We don't want to, we don't want, we don't want to go that product route, right? You know, so what we've done is we've made the haptic corridor so intuitive that everyone can figure out the right way to go. And then what we've done is we, through the user piece, we realized that people would get to the corner and they would stop and be like, okay, now where do I go next? So we started giving like preemptive left and right haptic signals on the way there. So you know that like left's coming up, you can kind of keep it moving. And in those we've standardized what left haptics are and what right haptics are. But our real goal is, is that who made us the haptic gods to determine what left and right haptic should be, right? You know, like our real goal is like, how do we build tools to allow you to like build your own version of whatever the standards are and then do machine learning at scale to see what left should be based off of community input as opposed to kind of like top down dictatorship. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jan, uh, founder of an augmented reality company called Beam, a uh, good friend of Ron's as well. Um, this is less of a question, more of a statement. Um, you know, the, the uh, ability for uh, everyone to come together and create an ecosystem like this, uh, I think has a huge impact on the commercialization of the tech. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, the largest tech companies in the US and they often say accessibility technology in its commercialization phase is a hit and miss for them to focus on. Um, and they'd rather focus on it as a, a project uh, to assist their PR or um, um, uh, to be able to talk about um, at their uh, AGMs. And um, you know, for everyone to be able to come together here and, and create all this data I think is gonna have a profound impact on the seriousness that these big tech companies will take on the industry. So really well done for that. Awesome, thank you, that's part of the goal. Great. Hi, I'm, uh, <coughs> pardon my throat. I'm Kevin Blomo, I work for 2U and edX and I'm a senior director of product accessibility there. And I'm uh, familiar with Teach Access as an organization that wants to bring into tech education standards and understanding into the curriculum so that people who start building products are aware at the outset of their careers how to approach it without having to come and, and kind of learn that on the job at some place that happens to care about it. I'm wondering if you're familiar with any organizations or, or uh, entities that are trying to push that same kind of education early into the system around 
the design UX field or into business or product strategy or thinking? It's a great question. Um, I actually am not. Um, I can say, though, that every week at Perkins, I get four to five emails from student groups who are working on a product in the assistive tech space, and they're looking for access to people to either talk about for primary market research or for user testing. Um, and so that leads me to make an assumption that universities are embedding this type of uh, user research and testing into their entrepreneurship programs or their industrial design programs. Uh, right now, we sometimes have the capability to, to meet those needs, but that's something that we want to stand up over the, you know, the coming year or two. Um, but I don't know of any. Jennifer, do, do you in the back? No? Okay. But we can also do some research and get back to you. I'm good at research, apparently. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Sandy. Yeah. So looking at those uh, charts, when you see all of those companies distributed, where are you like, oh my gosh, how is there not a company for X? Like, where are the big gaps and opportunities in your mind? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's a very, very good question. And I'm not sure I can do it justice with an answer right now. I, sure. would, I would say that um, on the... I looked at it a, like a month ago and I said, inclusive employment, four companies, that can't be right. Mm -hmm. And I went back in and actually realized that my data entry needed to be like more robust there. And all of a sudden I found 20, I think it was like 21 companies or something within this space. Um, and that's because in my research, it, um, it was really interesting in the coding for the language for those companies, disability didn't necessarily pop up in inclusive employment. So bias, uh, women engineering, uh, race, that pop, that, that would be like in the language describing the company, but not necessarily disability. And that's how I would miss it from the, the data poll. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is still a work in progress. I would say that that was one that I noticed. Yeah. Um, also, you know, education and completing college, there's a lot of information access technologies. Um, I was introduced to a company recently that's trying to improve uh, how Braille is printed. So, I don't, this, this is just a statistic that kind of, that kind of floors me. If you need like an advanced calculus braille textbook, it can take a year and a half to print and cost $35,000. Mm. So like huge problem um, in that space, right? And so I think that that's one. Uh, braille literacy rates globally are quite low, they're around 10%. So that's nine out of every 10 people who are blind or visually impaired actually don't read braille. Um, and a part of that has to do with Braille education and how tough it is. Um, and so there are some really interesting startups within, the, within that space. There's a company called Thinkerbell Labs, which is trying to gamify teaching Braille with a device that they're selling through APH called Poly. Um, and there's a, you know, a startup coming out of uh, Cornell that's like a glove uh, that uses an AI algorithm to read the Braille cell so that you get the, the feedback in real time as to what, what you're uh, feeling with your finger. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, these are just some spaces where I haven't seen as much attention, um, like Braille literacy, and it's a big problem um, that, that could, be, could be tackled. Because it's the only way that people who are visually impaired uh, can, can write. Hmm. It's the path to literacy, yeah. Sure. Hold on, could you take the mic? Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me if this is over simple, an oversimple question, but with the hundreds of, at minimum, hundreds of visually impaired people living in our community, where do they go to find all of these products? It's a very good question. Um, so in the education system, a lot of them come from an organization called American Printing House for the Blind. Uh, they provide a lot of the education assistive technology in the United States. Uh, there are also a lot of regional distributors of assistive technology. So you go to like your local uh, low vision and blindness distributor and what they have in stock is what you're exposed to. And so that's, and I, I actually did show the market map to a regional distributor, 
and uh, he recognized 5% of the companies on the market map, which shows that 95% of the technologies that are out there aren't necessarily on his radar, or they don't make sense for them to carry in their store because of they're an app, or um, the markups don't make sense. So I just thought that that was really interesting, because it means that if you, let's say you have some of, you know, cardiac event and you lose part of your vision, and you go to your local regional distributor to find out what assistive technology you can access, um, what they have is what you're exposed to. And so we're hoping that our market map and the research insights that we can put out through the Howe Innovation Center will evolve into a place where people can find a variety of technologies and services that might meet their needs or their loved one needs or their child's needs uh, by searching through uh, you know, what, what you're actually looking for. Thank you. Yep. We're going to do one last question. Do we have anyone? Do we have anyone here in the audience who would like to ask a last question, or do we have anything on the? Uh... All right. <clears throat> now I get to choose the last question. Oh, fun. <laughs> um, hmm. Okay, this is a good one. And it goes. Uh, if anyone was at our last meetup, what do you think? Uh, what do you all think is the best use of uh, artificial intelligence or AI for accessibility? It's a very specific one. I'm going to pa pass, it, pass it to Keith first. And I'm going to buy myself time to think. Um, artificial intelligence um, for accessibility. Um, uh, there's so many um, like ways you can go. I think that from speaking specifically from haptics, um, I spent two years studying color theory as a designer. I know how the brain processes color information, how eyes process color information, challenges of eyes processing color information, how to get around that. Also, I can do what? Get you to look at where I want you to look, right? But like, we don't have that kind of research with touch. Like, we don't have the scale. And why? Well, because, you know, touch was related to sex for most of human history, and we were like, don't do that. So guess what? Just like if you said, do something wearable technology, the first thing you do is put lights in your hoodie. If you pay research touch, the first thing you're going to do is research sex, right? And that was not allowed to happen. So what we ended up with is like a deficiency of research and like understanding how the brain processes touch information. And more importantly, like in our case, the average haptician, because you can't get a haptics degree at undergraduate or the master's level, the only thing that you can get close to a haptics degree is human computer interface. Um, and that's at the PhD level. And so, I mean, I may be wrong, so please feel, correct me, community, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm off target. But, you know, like, at the PhD level, essentially, is the only time where you get hapticians. So your average haptician has the same amount of, like, you know, like, knowledge base as, like, a general practitioner. Guess what that makes? That makes haptics really expensive to make. You know what? I need, I need an undergraduate haptic course. I need like a general assembly of haptics where I can put someone in and in nine or 12 months, they understand the fundamentals and can start working, right? And so I think that like where AI really supports the haptic space is like, like how do we do all this research at scale? Because I don't know if the things that, I, that vibrate and I like or the things that touch tactilely I like, you like, you like, or you like, right? And this is gonna be as personal as we get. In this world, it's like this is the only time haptics are the only way a digital product can touch you. And that's why it's so tightly controlled. Apple did a really great job putting controls on it. So apps aren't just buzz, 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 look at me, look at me, look at me, right? But now what we really need to do is we really need to open up these channels so that we can get more research in. And I think that like AI and machine learning on that research is going to like quantum leap. Um, our ability to kind of process all the information we're going to get at scale to do like actionable insights. I thought of an answer while listening at the same time. Um, so I actually thought of two. One is taking computer vision technologies and actually moving from interpreting what is there through, through like an optical character recognition to actually like a scene reader. So you're walking down the street and it's telling you like there's a blue house on your left and there is a car in the driveway rather than it just saying like 51 Maple Street, um, you know, like actually kind of taking it to the next level of what you're absorbing and where you are. I think that would be really um, impactful. Another is around augmentative and alternative communication tools. So 
<clears throat> everybody's afraid of chat GPT and these large language processing, but they actually have a big implication for the AAC systems. And I'm not quite sure how it would work, but I can just really see these large language models taking AAC communication to a new level. Um, so those are my two answers. Ron, do you have one? I think I think relating to Arc specifically, I think it um, for me it probably is related to computer vision and closing the gaps in what is seen reactively, um, and then you know over time with that information, the data AI will enable you to know, for example, if you're walking down VC Street or Day Street, that there is something on the left down. You know, it, it will close the gaps in reactivity as opposed to being a consumer of data that you see, there will be a baseline of information that is consumed and there will be gaps that get closed. And so that's not just speed, but it's accuracy. And I think there's also, you know, scarily intuition that goes along with that. Understanding, you know, we already have all, some of this already exists through Google, right? It knows that you go to Starbucks at a particular time of day and it gives you directions there. So I think closing the gaps in reactivity to me would be valuable. But again, I, I think some of the, the applications for AI will be specific to that use case. For me, I go immediately to computer vision, some of the stuff that maybe you talked about as well. Sandy, I'll let you close us out. All right. Thank you everyone so much for having us.